Good morning. Welcome to Christ Church. I want to thank everyone that brought uh, products for the uh, uh, Harvest Home. I know it's a little bit different than what it was years ago. Years ago, I can remember it was uh, fresh fruit, vegetables, and stuff, but uh, you know, these are items that uh, they don't get from food distribution, so uh, this is badly needed stuff, and it's appreciated. Uh, if you have a prayer list, request, or know someone who could use a prayer shawl, contact Joanne. Your number's in there. Uh, Monday is Emmaus Reunion Prayer Group. Prayer requests are welcome. Please contact Jane Shellhammer. Sandy Rumble or Connie Fetzer for that. Uh, Wednesday, uh, we have adult choir practice and we will also have the adult Bible study. Friday is TAG. Uh, next Sunday is Worldwide Communion. I'm not sure. Mark, do you know next week with Communion, is it going to be at the at the Alder Rail or? You know, no. Okay, well, we'll be surprised. <laughs> October 2nd, uh, Circle of Friends, any, anything, uh, Terry, Circle of Friends, anything? Okay. Okay, good, thank you. October uh, 10th or 12th at 6 p.m. is a fundraising banquet for Jewel Women's Center at Faith Church in Orangeburg. You must pre-register for this event. For more information, see the flyer posted on the bulletin board. Uh, Saturday, October 21st, mark your calendars for the church hayride. Uh, more information for that. The earlier hayride will be for the older people so they can get to bed early. <laughs> and, and then the later one will be for the kids that don't go to bed before midnight. <laughs> Chicken barbecue events, Wednesday, uh, pepper cabbage and pie shell making, Thursday, apple day, pies and dumplings, and pie filling. Uh, Friday, October 27th, uh, finish the pies and final prep and wrap potatoes. And then 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. is pre-order pie pickup and Saturday the big day. 10.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., all hands on deck. If you're working out at the fire pit, 5 a.m. is when they start uh, lighting the fire there. Uh, are there any additional announcements uh, on your far left? Center left section. Center right section. All right, section Lois. Just a reminder, if you do not get tickets for the chicken barbecue, Joe is not here today, but he lives here. Stand up, Neil. Stand up, Neil. There's Neil up there. So he is the ticket person today. Also, keep getting your pie orders. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, if uh, you didn't hear yet, Neil will have tickets for the. Uh, uh, Which are they a piece? I think they're uh, 14. <laughs> yeah, 14, and I think the pies are what, 13? Correct? No, 15. 15. Oh, okay. It was the other, okay. I also, uh, as usual, I forgot. Uh, the 6th, October 16th, is the March for Life in Harrisburg. Uh, I know I'm going, and I know uh, Carol Stein uh, will be going. I don't know if anybody else is interested. Uh, even though the uh, Supreme Court overruled the Roe versus Wade, you know our state is still not pro-life, and we need to show support for those that are in uh, our government that are for pro-life, and hopefully we can change people's hearts and they will realize that uh, life begins at conception. Hey, if there's no other, oh, Mark, yes. I just want to make a quick announcement. I don't know if everybody saw this in the uh, pre-worship videos announcements, but um, you know we're working through some issues with our live stream, and what we want to ask you to do today, and as an experiment, is 
please put your phones on airplane mode or at least turn off your Wi-Fi so that the phones aren't constantly trying to ping the Wi-Fi and connect to it. Um, uh, we, I submitted a ticket to, the, to support for the Mevo camera and they said, suggested that maybe there's a lot of radio interference with everybody in the church at the same time. We don't have any issues during the week. I run a test for three hours and nothing goes wrong. <laughs> We're in here for one hour and it drops like five times. So um, let's try that today if we could, thanks. All right, and I want to thank uh, J2O that uh, they're back. <laughs> so we'll continue with the, uh, the service, thank you.
Lord. Amen. I greet you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he pronounced. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations. Please remain standing for J2O. <coughs> no, we
Our scripture reading this morning is a familiar one, taken from Matthew chapter 13. You'll find that on page 1522 in your pew Bible. Prepare your hearts for the reading of God's holy word. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Continuing in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore and they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. There ends the reading of God's holy word. May the Lord give his blessing to the hearing and the reading of it. Let's bow our heads as we pray together. Father, we praise you and thank you this morning for your love and patience that you show to us in so many ways. You have been with us from the beginning, through it all, the good and the not so good. In our times of triumph, great gladness, success, well-being, you have been there because we know that every good thing comes from you, Lord. In our times of loss, sadness, failure, and sickness, you have been there to give us hope, to give us peace love and joy, because even when we're going through the worst of it, we know that those good things are all found only in you and your promise through your son. Lord, we pray that we will be mindful of the needs of our neighbors and be ready to help where we can. Give us your eyes for the lost, the lonely, the hurting, so that we might see those in need, and give us your compassion for those in need, so that we might take action. Lord, on this National Gold Star Family Day, we pray for the families who have lost loved ones in the line of duty to our country. We pray that your spirit would provide comfort and peace to them in their time of mourning. We also pray, Lord, for the Harvest Home items donated for the food pantry. Lord, we pray that your glory and your love would be shown to the people who come to our church to receive these items, and they would leave here feeling blessed and loved by you and your people. And now we pray specifically for those on our prayer list who are in need of your protection, your love, and your healing. We pray for Jess, Penny, Jolie, Carl, Mike, Carol, Terry, Timothy, Barb, Todd, Loretta, Michael, Michelle, Donald, Jill, Valerie, Paul, Aaron, Johanna, Melissa, Timothy, Melinda, Rob, Joan, 
the people of Ukraine, and the Rodriguez Kleckner families as they travel to Florida to visit a dying relative. We pray for a spiritual wall of protection around Christ Church, the faith family, and the people here this morning. And we pray in agreement with one voice for these we now bring before you. Father, we pray that you would keep these family and friends safe wherever they are and meet them where they need you the most, working in their lives to show your glory. And help us all to truly follow your Son, who taught us the importance of praising you, trusting you, and forgiving others when he taught us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. service by receiving our offer.
thank you for this opportunity to give back to your use some of what you have given to us. And Lord, we know that the greater offering is our lives in service to you. And so, Lord, we pray today that we would be true disciples and make disciples for your kingdom. We pray all this in the name of the one who came to show us the way, our teacher, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to come forward. What Pastor Mark is going to say later is very, very important. And so I want you to pay close attention. But when he asked me to talk to you this morning, I thought, oh my goodness, I haven't talked to you guys in a long time. I want to make for sure that I say what God would have me say. And so I asked God, and this is how I did it. Lord, what would you have me say to my friends? To my young friends. That's what I said. Because you know, you can talk to God like you talk to your mom and dad or, or like your best friend. So, and then I waited. Now, it doesn't always happen so quickly, but I got an answer very, very quickly. And this is what the Lord wanted you to hear this morning. And it's a passage. It's actually one of my favorites. But I have a lot of favorites, so you can't go by that. Okay? And it's from 1 Timothy 4. And I bet you some of the people... In our church family are already going to know what, what I'm going to have to say, but this is, this is what it says. Okay, now listen carefully. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now, I am going to give you a test this morning, okay? I want you to raise your hand. How many of you are young? Okay, you, all right, all right, you are young. Okay. So this passage is for you. Don't let anyone look down on you, excuse me, because you are young. Now I have to tell you that God loves everybody, but he loves young people just real in a special way. And even whole civilizations will be judged on how they treat their young people, how they treat their babies, whole civilizations are judged by God on how they treat people like you, okay? Now, I know some of you have brothers and sisters, and so it's not always easy to be you know, a good example, right? Can, can I get an amen from you? <laughs> amen, right, okay. It's not always good to be a good example. It's not always easy to be a good example. But what we know, because I've known a lot of you, excuse me again, I've known a lot of you very, very long time, in fact, since you were in your mommies. And I know that you love Jesus. And so what we know, what we, we know is that even though we can't always, because we have brothers and sisters, and everybody knows how that goes, okay? And we have moms and dads, and they can be a challenge sometimes too, okay? <laughs> that we can pray, and that Jesus will help us be a good example. Now, first of all, let me say this, because I'm going to get in trouble later if I don't say this. This does not mean that you don't have to listen to your mommies and daddies. Okay, all right, that's a given, right? But what it does mean is that you can talk to God for yourself. And when you're not doing anything else, and when you are quiet and you talk to God, he will talk back. And that you will know in your heart, and with his help, what it is that he wants you to do. And I think that's pretty cool when you're a young person because you don't get a lot of perks when you're young, okay? And so, if I want to know what God wants me to do to be a good, to be good, okay, to be a, a good example, how do you think I would say it? What would I say? Like, how would I say that? Kind of like I asked for what the Lord wanted you to hear today. Maybe I would say, Lord, help me to be a good example because right now I don't feel like it. 
Maybe I would say that, don't you think? I think so too. So let's pray that when we are not being a good example, that the Lord would help us, that we would remember to ask the Lord to help us to be a good example, and to remember that even though we're young, God loves us in a very special way, and we can talk to him for ourselves, okay? So let's bow our heads and pray, okay? Bow our heads and pray. Well, Father God, we thank you that you love us in a special way because we are young. And we pray that when we're not feeling like we can be a, a good example, that you would help us and we give you permission. And we want to tell you that we love you. And when you have something to say to us, we pray that you would say it in a way that we would hear you and we would understand. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okie dokie. Let's see. I think we have a basket back here. Oh, we do. They didn't move it. Okay. There you go. that children's sermon because that is about as good as any 20 minute sermon you're going to hear. <laughs> um, also, there are these little goldfish up here. There's another one back there. I don't know where they came from, but I saw it this morning and I thought, as soon as I thought, it, remi I, it reminded me of Jesus. So I thought I'll just leave this here for now. I'll have to clean it up later or it'll get moldy though. All right, so in his book, Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart, How to Know For Sure that you are saved, author J.D. Greer tells a story about how he came to be believer baptized four times as a teen. Most people understand that you only get believer baptized once, so how did this young man get baptized four times? Well, J.D. says he first accepted Jesus at the age of four when he asked his parents about how to get to heaven. And they told him about Jesus, and he asked Jesus into his heart and was believer baptized at church soon afterward. He was happy with that until his freshman year of high school when at youth group, his Sunday school teacher preached on Matthew 7, 21 to 23, which reads, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now all of a sudden he realized that many people who think they're going to heaven, people who have asked Jesus into their heart, people who have been baptized, will be shocked when they are turned away by Jesus. J.D. was completely terrified and started to worry that he'd be one of those who would be turned away. So he asked Jesus into his heart again. Then he was rebaptized and gave a testimony in church about how he was getting serious about God. 
Then he began to doubt again. Was he really sorry enough? Other people cried when they got saved. They cried a lot. He didn't cry. Did that mean he wasn't sorry enough? Then there were some sins that he couldn't seem to be able to stop himself from doing no matter how hard he tried. Was he really sorry for those? So he prayed the sinner's prayer again to ask Jesus into his heart. And again, and again. And each time he would feel good about things for a while, but then the worry and the doubt would eventually come back. In the four years of high school, JD went up front for a lot of altar calls. He says he's pretty sure that he's been saved at least once in every denomination. <laughs> and the times when he'd start to feel a little assurance in his most recent confession of faith, he'd also get baptized four times. JD says he was a regular at his church's baptism services and even had his own locker in the changing area. <laughs> but, JD says, it was a wretched experience. My spiritual life was a train wreck characterized by endless circles of doubt, aisle walking, and submersions in water. I could not find the assurance of salvation no matter how often or how sincerely I asked Jesus into my heart. So, what's the answer to all that? Well, if you know me, you know we'll get to that later. But first, let's get to the scripture lesson for today. So today we're wrapping up part three in a three-part series on the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 13. I bet you didn't know that we were doing a three-part series when I started with part one on July 16th. That's okay, I didn't know either. <laughs> Nevertheless, here we are, kingdom of, kingdom of heaven, part three. So in part one, we looked at the parable of the sower and the four different types of soil that a farmer might sow his seeds in and the results that could be expected from the seed in that soil. First, it was the hard-packed earth where the seeds could not penetrate and the birds came and ate them up. Second, the rocky ground with a thin layer of soil. The planted seeds sprang up quickly but soon died out because it had no roots. Third, soil with thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Fourth and final was the good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. And these people, the fourth and final soil, these are the people who hear the word, understand it, and live it out. Then on August 13th, part two, we looked at the parable of the wheat and the weeds, where Jesus warns us that in the kingdom there will be wheat, and mixed in there will also be weeds. The wheat are the good soil people who hear the word, understand it, and live it. But mixed in there will be weeds, the other types of soils, the hardened hearts, the shallow who fall away quickly, the distracted who worry about and chase after money and things. Jesus warns us that the roots of the wheat and weeds are so intertwined that you couldn't pull up one without also damaging the other. Trying to rip up the weeds would also destroy the good wheat because we simply are not qualified to determine the weeds from the wheat. So Jesus says, let both grow together until the harvest. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now finally, part three. Now if you remember from the last two sermons, Jesus started out this teaching out by the lake, standing on a boat. He had just had a very bad day. In chapter 12, he got into two arguments with the Pharisees about Sabbath laws, and then they started to plot to kill him. He drives demons out of a possessed man, so the Pharisees accuse him of being in league with Satan. He warns them they'll be condemned for eternity if they keep this up, calling them an evil brood of vipers. And then his family shows up and tries to undermine him, saying that he is out of his mind. And then later that day, he goes out by the lake to sit down and just relax. Ugh, you know how it feels. But the people find him there, and a crowd gathers. So he moves to a boat, and from there, starts to teach the crowd in parables about the kingdom of heaven. First the sower and the seeds, then the wheat and the weeds, and next two similar parables using a mustard seed and yeast in verses 31 to 33. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Now if you remember the first two parables about sowing seeds and 
wheat versus weeds, are teaching the people about how the kingdom of heaven will be a mixed bag. There will be true believers who earnestly follow Jesus and try to listen to his words and follow his commands. And there will be others who want to but aren't really invested enough, plus those who aren't interested at all, but are just there for the ride. And finally, there will be those who are actually really, really bad. Like we talked about in part two, although there are a lot of ordinary, seemingly nice people in the weeds, there are also a fair amount of really bad people doing really bad things in the world. So the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus is teaching us, is very complex. It is not a simple good versus evil. There will be good, and there will be evil, and there will be all kinds of in-between. And so it is with these two parables. There is both good and bad here. The mustard seed was the smallest seed known in the area at the time. Using this tiny seed to represent the beginning of the kingdom of heaven would have shocked most of the crowd at that time. The people of Israel always believed that when God's kingdom came to earth, it would be a great kingdom with immense power and mighty military victories. They were not expecting Jesus to tell them that it would start out tiny and insignificant like a mustard seed. But here Jesus is saying that the kingdom is already here, but it's just getting started and not very big yet. Jesus says, though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. So the kingdom will start out small, like it was at that time, but it will grow exponentially in time into something huge and amazing. There are several Old Testament references to trees with birds in their branches that are used to describe the greatness of, of a kingdom. As an example, Ezekiel 17, 22 to 23 says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. Here, a tender sprig taken and planted by God is actually a reference to Jesus. He and his kingdom would be great, like a tall, strong cedar, and birds of every kind will nest and find shelter there. Notice the birds of every kind. The Matthew Henry commentary for this patch is in, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel says, the Christian church was at first like a grain of mustard seed, but became like this tender branch, a great tree, its beginning small, but its latter end increasing to admiration. When the Gentiles flocked into the church, then did the fowl of every wing come and dwell under the shadow of this goodly cedar. Even the birds of prey, which those preyed upon as the wolf and the lamb feeding together. So good? Yes, the kingdom of heaven started out small, but it grew exponentially throughout the centuries, and now is the largest religion in the world. As of the year 2021, Christianity had approximately 2.38 billion followers out of a worldwide population of about 8 billion people, which is nearly one third of the world's population. So lots of birds perching in those branches, birds of all kinds. Remember the birds in the first parable that came in and ate up the seeds that the sower had cast on the hard packed earth? Those birds represented the evil one who comes and snatches away what was sown in the heart. Many times in scripture, birds are just birds, but other times they are also used to represent evil. So how many of those birds perching in the branches of the, of the kingdom are good soil people, and how many are wheat versus weeds? Who knows? But remember, we're not supposed to judge that. We're not qualified. Again, even though this parable seems so different from the first two, it's very similar in that Jesus is warning us there will be good and there will be bad, and we're just going to have to deal with it for a time. The next parable about the yeast is also telling us something very similar. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed about into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. In this short parable, there are several things going on here. First, notice the flour is 60 pounds. That is a lot of flour. A huge amount, actually, for someone to try to mix by hand. So the prevailing opin opinion among scholars is that the world is the flour. Yeast is a change agent. It is a form of fungi that 
multiply rapidly due to fermentation. Mixed with flour and water, it causes the dough to change from a dense and com compact dough to one that is expanded with air to create a light, fluffy, and delicious bread. Who doesn't like bread? So the yeast, the gospel, the kingdom of heaven will enter the world and because of its message of hope through Jesus Christ, it will be a change agent affecting the entire world. Good again, right? Yes. But scripture also uses yeast in many places in a negative way because fermentation implies corruption. For example, in Matthew 16 and Mark 8, a story is told, Matthew 5 to 6 reads, when they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now the disciples got confused and they think Jesus is reprimanding them because they forgot to bring bread. But Jesus corrects them in verses 11 to 12. How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in the bread, but against the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So yeast can be a change agent for good, but it can also be a change agent for bad. There have been a lot of great Christian things done throughout the years, the ages in the name of Christ. Universities and hospitals all started as Christian organizations. Orphanages to take care of the most vulnerable were started by Christians. Christians campaigned for prison reform and better housing. It was Christianity that fought to end slavery in the US and around the world. Christianity is behind a huge number of charities that support the poor, the underprivileged, prisoners, the homeless, and those seeking justice. But then there are all the bad things that people have done claiming the name of Christ. Probably the one that comes to mind, for most people anyway, right away is the Spanish Inquisition where about 150 thousand people were tortured and prosecuted for various offenses and about 5,000 were executed. In 2010, our youth group went on a mission trip to Montana where we worked with some Blackfeet there to build a youth camp. A local Blackfeet minister, Pastor Titus, told us how the government in the past had used Christianity and churches as a way to strip the Blackfeet of their culture and their heritage. And there are then also the various and numerous sex and child abuse scandals. I mean, I could spend all day here going through all the list of bad things, but suffice it to say, the yeast can be a change agent for good, and it can be a change agent for bad. Again, the kingdom will grow as the yeast works in the bread, and there will be good and bad to deal with. At this point, Jesus left the crowd and went into the nearby house. Now he is only with his closest followers, and after explaining the meaning of the parables of the sower and the seeds and the parables of the wheat and the, and the weeds, he tells them the parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl. In verses 44 to 46, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Here Jesus is moving away from explaining that the kingdom will grow with good and bad to the value of the kingdom. In both of these parables, the person sells everything they have to gain the treasure, a pearl of great value. And when you find the treasure or pearl, nothing is worth more than the kingdom of heaven. Nothing. The first one accidentally finds a treasure in a field, the second one earnestly seeking for pearls when he finds the pearl of great value. In the kingdom of heaven, there will be people who seemingly stumble upon the gospel and are saved, and there will be those who came to a saving knowledge of Christ through seeking and study. But however you come to the gospel and are saved, the only way you do that and gain the kingdom of heaven is to give up your old way of thinking about yourself, the world, and God. To be good soil people hearing the word, understanding it, and living it out in our daily lives. After these two parables, Jesus says, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. 
The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Notice he starts this out with, once again, why would he do that? Well, remember how this all started. First the sower and the seeds, the different kinds of people that will hear the gospel and how they will respond to it. Then the wheat and the weeds. And let me, let me remind you that at the end of that parable, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his, out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. The weeds are gathered up, tied in bundles, and burned. And in this parable also, so it will be at the end of the age, the good fish will be separated from the bad fish, and the bad fish will be thrown away into the blazing furnace. All throughout this chapter, Jesus is teaching us about his kingdom. It will get big on this earth. And because of that, it will be a complex mixed bag of good and bad, which need, means that we need to be able to love each other even when we aren't feeling it. But all that will end, and when it does, do you want to be good soil people or bad soil people? Do you want to be wheat or do you want to be weeds? Do you want to be good fish or do you want to be bad fish? So let's just assume that everyone here wants to be the good fish. We all want to be the good in the kingdom of heaven, right? So let's go back to where we started. If saying the sinner's prayer doesn't do it, what does? How do we know that we are saved? In the Gospel of Mark, at the end of chapter 8, Jesus says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the Gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? You want to know how to be sure you're saved? Become a disciple. Because the truth is that when we tell people that they will be saved if they just repeat a sinner's prayer and ask Jesus to come into their hearts, we are not teaching them the same thing that Jesus taught us. In his book, J.D. Greer writes, praying the sinner's prayer has become something like a tra tradition or a fad we have people go through to gain entry into heaven. As gospel shorthand, it presents salvation as a transaction someone has with Jesus and moves on from, rather than the beginning of a posture we take toward the finished work of Christ and maintain for the rest of our lives. And there it is. Can it really be that easy? Do you see it? You can have it, but you have to give up a lot to have it. First, repent and believe. Repent. Turn away from your old way of thinking about yourself, the world, and God. Sell it all. And believe in Jesus and his finished work on the cross. Believe that he is the Son of God, sent down from heaven to be the perfect sacrificial lamb and pay the price for our sins. <coughs> Believe and keep believing. Then follow. Follow Jesus and his teaching. Keep following. Keep learning. Keep growing. Go to church and Sunday school. You're here. Good. Check. <laughs> now go deeper. Youth. Go to youth group and pay attention during the lessons. If you're an adult, go to Bible study. If you can't make it to ours, find one somewhere or start your own. Everybody, read the Bible. Get a Bible reading plan and stick to it. And then get involved. Find a ministry and be a part of it. We have a lot here at Christ Church. We have benevolence and chicken barbecue, food pantry, soup night, circle of friends, shelter in the storm, widows about God, youth group, you know, Connie Fetzer approached me a few months ago and said that God had really placed it on her heart to do something with the youth, but she's not a fun person. <laughs> they call her anti-fun or anti-fun. <laughs> so I thought about it for a couple months and I came up with, a, with an idea and I, and I approached her with it. I said, you know, what would be really great, you know, we have pizza all the time. Um, and so, you know, I get sick of that every once in a while. If you could maybe not necessarily do it all the time, but be an organizer of a group of people who provide a hot meal at the youth group night for like maybe once a month or once every other month, something. I think that would be a great way to start a ministry like that. So she has agreed to do that. And uh, if you're looking for a ministry to be a part of, talk to Connie, you can be a part of that, right? And all these others that we talked about. And I'm sure maybe I missed a few, but you get the point. Want to know how you can be sure you're saved? There's nothing wrong with praying a sinner's prayer. 
And there's nothing wrong with asking Jesus into your heart. I prayed it. I've asked Jesus into my heart. I've also led a sinner's prayer to him. In some respects, you really do need to do those things because that's the start of repentance. But that can't be it. That can't be the end of it or it just isn't true. After that, the way to know is to believe and keep believing. Follow and keep following. Repent, believe, follow. Stop worrying if you've been sorry. Stop worrying about whether you really meant it when you asked Jesus in your heart. I've been worrying about those things for most of my life. I wasn't believed or baptized four times, only once, but I worried and wondered and doubted my faith. And it wasn't until I stopped worrying about being a Christian and I start being a Christian, trying to do everything not for myself but for God, for Jesus, it wasn't until then that I knew that I knew. Don't get me wrong. My wife, my family can tell you, I am far from perfect. I have a lot to learn and so much more to grow in Christ. But then that's why we're all here this morning together at church, right? To learn and grow in Christ together. Repent, believe, and follow. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Lord God, we thank you for your son and his words. He is the great teacher and we are his students. Send your spirit, we pray, to help us deepen our knowledge and faith in Jesus that we might continue to grow and learn so that we can share the gospel with others and bring them into your kingdom. We pray this in the name of the one who came to show us the way, our teacher, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please stand. Please stand for the benediction. The benediction comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. May the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. Amen.